Good morning, and you're very welcome to this morning's Signpost webinar. Uh, my name is Pat Murphy. I'm Head of Environment uh, Knowledge Transfer with Chagask. And the Signpost series is brought to you by Chagask in association with uh, Food Drink Ireland Skillnet, National Rural Network, and Dairy Sustainability Ireland. Uh, this morning, we're, I'm joined by uh, Parik Foley to help with the questions. Parik, you're very welcome. Thanks very much, Pat. Morning, everyone. Hi, and we're joined this morning by uh, Dr. Douglas Macmillan and by uh, Evan Short. Uh, if you draw on your, your uh, video there and, and unmute yourselves. Uh, this morning, our, our topic is the story of our bogs. And our bogs play a surprisingly large role in our carbon story and, and will be doing uh, going forward. I think it's a uh, I suppose, a, a relatively unknown part of, of the story. Douglas? Um, yeah, just, uh, Pat is, is telling me that the host has disabled the camera, so okay. I can't start it, so I don't know if if, if, perhaps if it's Yvonne. Okay, well, we'll try and get that. We'll, we'll, we'll continue conversing and, and, and try and get that that, that sorted and see what's, what's happening yeah. there. Okay, we have you. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, as I was saying, the, the, the bogs, Will, uh, are going to play a huge part in, in the story of our, our um, carbon journey over the next while. You might give us an idea of the extent to which we are uh, getting carbon or emitting carbon at the, at the moment from our bogs. Um, yeah, well, I think the conservative estimate is there's at least 10 million tonnes of CO2 coming from our bogs. Um, it's, it's probably higher, but that's that's the kind of figure, and there's a lot of monitoring to be done to get a more precise figure. That's so a lot, a, a lot of change required, and, and and a lot of intention to to change. Uh, uh, Evan, you're involved in the the farm carbon project as project coordinator. And you might just give us a, a quick indication of what what's involved in that project. Yeah, so uh, farm carbon is uh, looking at. Um, peat soil uh, regeneration, peat soil rewetting there in the three catchments of the Silver River, the Camker and the Little Brosna. So it's a catchment focused program. The intention is the delivery or the, the task is the delivery of a payment for results scheme for um, peat soils uh, in Ireland, um, peat soils under agricultural management. So as Doug was mentioning, 10 million tonnes of that, uh, 8 million tonnes are from uh, transited, from drained peat grasslands, basically. So that's so the core focus. The program. There's potential for reduction, but there's also uh, a potential for income to be generated by, by those reductions. Mm -hmm. Yes, most definitely. Yes. Yeah. So in the context of the carbon farming scheme, this is what we'll be looking at. It's an, uh, it's an additional incentive structure to be added on top of cap subsidy payments to farmers through this program, which will be rolled out European wide. We'll get to it a little later on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, this is, the, I suppose, the first time we're dealing with our bogs in the signpost series. So uh, I think you're going to start with the story of our bogs, uh, Douglas. So it should be fascinating. So uh, if you want to take it away there. Okay. If that's coming up. Yes. Perfect. Okay. Good. Brilliant. Okay. So just uh, thanks very much uh, for that. Pat. The, um, so just I am, I'm presenting this. What's the story of our bogs? As you said, it's the first time you're covering it. So I've got a, a, quite a lot in there. I'm trying to pack it in, so I'll try and get it on time, uh, if that's okay. But if I can get a little bit of leeway, that'd be brilliant. Um, so just to move on, that's just our partners on the program that Evan was just mentioning. We have the two main projects we're working on. We're working on restoration of actual bogs in Mayo, and then we have the farm carbon project in, uh, in and around Offaly. So just a, a little bit about Green Restoration Ireland Cooperative. So we set up uh, back in 2019. So a member of the Irish Cooperative Organization Society. And we set up with the intention of supporting rural development through actions, including preparation for offsetting um, to restore a natural landscape. And we, our focus is practical community oriented solutions based on scientific data, because that's, that's my background. So this is one of the frogs from our bogs. So getting onto the onto what is peat back onto the subject matter. So peat, it's essentially um, in the waterlogged environments uh, where the plant material dies. It's only partially decomposed because of the wet and the anoxic conditions. So what happens is, seed is an over season. This will accumulate and pile on top of each other, and and then as it as more accumulation takes place, it gets compacted. But the key thing in relation to peat is is water. It's all about the water. 
So um, where you have a waterlogged bog like that, you have about 90%. Uh, if you ever walked on a healthy bog, you'd be walking on it and, you, and it will actually ripple as you're walking across it. So here we have a sphagnum cuspidatum pool in the bottom left that will be very wet and then of course the harvest that you need to dry it sufficiently that you can you can uh, cut it and dry it out so this is what we're looking at in the top right of the, the, the screen just i wanted to comment sorry i think in the in the description of the title there was an error um i had put in that it's a, a too high a figure i hadn't accounted for the 15 percent of our bog lands that are owned by quilcha so it's about 77 percent um well by default based on how much board the mona has which is about five percent of the total parks and wildlife have about three percent quilcher have 15 percent by default that would leave about 75 77 percent in the hands of farmers and landowners and overall we have about one one and a half million hectares of peatlands or 21 percent uh, of the land area of the country in terms of the condition that they're in <coughs> you have about 17 percent would be natural or near natural in relatively good conditions so um, as they would have been originally. Cut over bog accounts for about 39% of the total. About 19% is a forested. And then about 19% uh, is, the, is the part that we were discussing where it's been converted from peatland to pasture. So it's been grazed in, in, uh, for various, uh, for, for dairy or for beef. So overall, we're looking at about 1.2 million hectares of degraded peatlands, which is over 80% of the total. So a lot of work to do in terms of turning that around, as we're saying, about 10 million tons being emitted from that on an annual basis at a conservative estimate. So um, in terms of uh, carbon, it's, it's all the rage at the moment. So very timely that we're talking about this. So how much are we talking about? Well, um, again, an estimate is that there's about one and a half billion tons uh, of carbon stored in the Irish bogs. Uh, which would constitute about 53% of the soil of the total organic carbon, soil organic carbon, on about 20% of the land area. And just for comparative purposes, that would be about four to five times what we have in our woodlands. So that's a lot. So it's reasonable to ask why, um, particularly as bogs are very uh, low productivity. Essentially, raised bogs will be dependent on the nutrition from the rainfall, which is, which is virtually none. Uh, it's also very weather dependent. So in a dry year, you might actually have bogs emitting more uh, greenhouse gases than they, than they sequester. But a healthy bog generally would, would sequester between about half and two tons of CO2 per hectare per year. So it's not very productive compared to forests and maybe grasslands. But the fact is, because it can continue accumulating on top of itself, it can keep doing that over thousands of years. And this is, this is what has happened. Just a question there, so how much in about two meters or more of peat, um, you'd be talking about, if you have a certain uh, depth of peat, 10, 15 centimeters, there'd be as much carbon in that as there would be in a mature spruce woodland, uh, yield class 16. Um, so you're talking about a thousand tons of carbon plus, if you do the maths and multiply it up for the two, two meters depth of peat, or more or less about 20 times what you'd have um, the, the, the amount of carbon you'd have in a similar land area of forest so so a lot and just just to give you a visual there as you can see this little small bit of peat in the middle of all of that forest stores more carbon than all of that forest put together so that's the the, the, the scale of things just to go a little bit further so if we say uh, some of our bogs you know the raised bogs in particular if they haven't been cut away uh, too much or if they're still intact they're going to be more than four meters uh, in depth so there'll be a several, uh, 2,000 tons or more per hectare, and that will be equivalent, just to give you an idea of the scale, you can see the, the little small man there at the foot of a, quite a small redwood. Uh, that, will be a, that will be equivalent to or more than uh, the giant redwood forest in California. So just next time you're looking at the little scraggy bit of bodland, if there were, that was a woodland, that would actually be towering, potentially towering above you uh, into, the, into the sky, 100 meters or more. Um, and we have actually found fields which would, would constitute uh, that, that amount of carbon. Just while we're making the comparison between the trees and the boglands, just it might be relevant to ask the question, do they go together? So again, uh, just as a reminder, about 19% are reforested. Um, but again, as I said, it's all about the water. So if the water goes out, then the oxygen comes in and the peat degrades and it releases CO2 into the atmosphere and it will release uh, dissolved organic carbon into the waterways. So Obviously, as part of the preparation for forestry, it's ditched, it's drained, and in addition, the trees will act as giant wicks uh, through their respiratory processes. They will vapor transpire thousands of gallons of water per year. 
So they will further accelerate the drying process, thereby accelerating the decomposition uh, of the peat. Um, so they don't really go. Uh, in terms of some of the, the emission rates, so it's all about ranges. Uh, you have to measure specifically uh, to get the exact area, which is quite tricky. Uh, so in terms of farm peatlands, maybe 8 to 20 tonnes of CO2 equivalent per hectare per year would be released, so 3 to 8 million tonnes. And a forest of peatlands, according to some studies, would release up to four, four more tonnes in excess of the carbon that would be getting sequestered into the, into the, into the trees. So uh, quite a lot. Just in, in terms of some of the solutions that we're looking at in Green Restoration Ireland, um, we see a combination of the, the results-based payment uh, development, that approach uh, that we're working on as part of the Farm Carbon EIP in the Midlands and offsetting. So I just wanted to touch on those briefly. So again, obviously there's the, the pre-existing EIPs, so Hen Harrier, Bride, Pearl Muscle, Farm Peat would be our sister project in the Midlands. They're doing a lot, they've done a lot of good work in relation to peatland restoration. So they're, they're already leading the charge. This is our logo in the top right-hand side, so Farm Carbon. Um, and again, I'm sure for those of you that have been listening to the series, uh, you're familiar with them. So results-based payment schemes, uh, it's essentially payment for the good quality habitat and then improvement and you get paid for that. The difference with us is that we're doing before and after. So we've been measuring the baseline and then our aim is to implement mitigation measure and see what the actual quantitative impact is in terms of reduced greenhouse gases and so on. We're also looking at new technologies, analytical approaches, and farmer-friendly friendly technologies in the, in the, in the midterm. Offsetting then is the key thing we started with. Uh, there's different types. So we have the, the one in the Holland Green Deal. They don't have any peatlands left there. So it's essentially about regulating water levels on peaty fields, uh, more futures, peatland code, and so on. So just a few, a few things to, to clarify in relation to this. So offsetting principles. First of all, I think uh, I've seen some of the articles. There's a bit of confusion. There's a voluntary and there's the emission trading scheme, which is mandatory. So offsetting is a voluntary thing. It's a company maybe needs to, it's done its best in terms of reducing its CO2 emissions, but it still has offsets that it, it still has emissions that would like to offset with a suitable project. A few other principles. So baseline scenario, the thing is, what will happen if the bog is left, at, let's say the, the, the abandoned bog with the drain still in it, which is bleeding out the water, is left in place? What will happen? And we'll see in the next couple of slides. Another thing is additionality. So again, you can't plant a field with grants, so say government grants, and then say, oh, I'll get some carbon offsets. That's not additional. That was going to happen anyway. So it's the money from the offsetting that pays for the work to be done. Leakage is another issue as well. So <clears throat> you can't deprive, let's say, remove access to a resource, let's say turf cutting, and then it's transferred to another area. That would be something to consider. Permanence also. Similarly, no point putting a lot of effort into a project if all those trees are going to be cut down or the bog is going to be drained at some time in the future. So they have to be permanent. And then lastly, there's the requirement for monitoring, reporting and verification. So that would involve uh, doing follow up. So first of all, the verification by a third party to co confirm that your project is legitimate and then the monitoring that's carried out uh, subsequently to, to, to confirm that uh, you have achieved the re-wetting and this, the restoration of the bog. Just the baseline for what, what would happen to the peatlands if they were left alone. Well, as I said, it's like a sponge, it's drained, it will oxidize. So how much will it shrink by? Well, we, we have a good idea. This is, if you're a bit of an ecology nerd, you'll be, you'll be familiar with this Hom Fem post in Whittlesey Mere. The landowner at the time fancied that bogs were sponges and he wanted to see what would happen when he, as he was draining it. So he put this post in place. The top of the post is where the bog used to be. And what's happened is it's oxidized its way down to the groundwater, the, the groundwater level, and it stopped oxidizing. So that's 22 feet down to eight feet. So that's what will happen to all bogs um, if they're not re-wetted. Similarly, in the future, again, we, we see more and more fires. Uh, so as things warm up, a dry bog is essentially a big tinder box. So as we have um, that, and that burning, we release very significant levels of CO2. Um, and once it's badly burned, it's very hard to restore. In terms of the approach that's used um, in relation to this, what we're looking to, as, as I said, we, we started off in Mayo and we were looking at using the existing peatland code. It's climatically, it's similar, but not the same as Ireland. Ultimately, want, we want to do a peatland code for Ireland, a wetland code. And, but essentially the principle is simple. If you are monitoring, as I said, a peatland, it would cost you a fortune. So what you do is you identify the vegetation type, 
let's say sphagnum or heather or what have you. And based on measurements that have been done on other sites, you correlate that, you map the area out and say, this is degraded, this is partially degraded, this is healthy. And you can determine how much is being emitted from each different block of the site. And in relation to greenhouse gas uh, gases, it's not what's being sequestered, although ultimately if it's successful, there would be a small amount sequestered on an annual basis. It's what's avoided. So uh, again, I, I make the point, that when you're buying uh, trees as carbon offsets, it's future selling. You are planting trees on this land and saying in 100 years time or 50 years time, there will be X tons of carbon. With bogs, it's back selling because the carbon is there. You're just locking it in. So it's a safer bet, essentially. Um, just a few other key things. It's got to be credible for methodology, robust, practical, repeatable, and so on, uh, based on an understanding of those processes. Um, so we want to adapt that process for the other existing codes in Europe and the UK. Just very quickly here, you can see on the left hand side, you have the intact bog and you have this classic hummock hollow uh, lawn micro topography. That would be a healthy bog that would be sequestering, as I said, half to two tons of CO2 per earth carbon per hectare per year. Then as it's drained, the draining process starts, that collapses back. So you have a, a kind of homogenous surface. And then that would start to be, that would be emitting CO2. And then as it gets drier and drier, the vegetation changes until you have a kind of a heath type vegetation. And just an, an indication here. So intact, based on the peatland code, you'd have about a ton of emissions per year, moderately degraded, two and a half, within a certain distance of a drain four. And then if it's bare peat, it would be up to 24 tons. This is just the method that's used by the Dutch. As I said, this is basically a graph illustrating that as you raise the water table level in the, the, the level of the water in the ditch, so the level of CO2 emissions declines. Just uh, two days ago, we had a very seminal event. We did our first rewet. Tommy McGovern is the owner up there. Uh, Lakadoff is one of our members in the ditches. So we actually started. We've done our started our first wet based uh, on this approach. So uh, that was great to see. It's only been a couple of years in the making. So uh, uh, it was uh, it was quite something for me anyway. Uh, other issues in ecosystem services: decomposing peat. As I said, as the peat degrades, it's it either majority into the air is CO2, but also a certain proportion has dissolved organic carbon going into the waterways. And the, the range is, as you can see, it's about 0.17 to 0.26 tons per hectare per year of dissolved organic carbon. Nutrients also, so there'll be a certain amount of ammonia, nit nitrates, very little phosphate, but there will also, that will also be going into the waterways. And then, of course, if it's a bare peat surface, that will be getting washed into the rivers and, and add, in, add in a nutrient load there. And you'll be familiar with the brown coloration of the bog that comes from the iron complexes in the in the peat drainage water. Flood control, so again, a healthy uh, bog will act as a, a, a giant sponge and it will absorb excess rainwater and release it steadily. But once it's cut open, obviously that will then release it very readily. So it adds to flood events. So a healthy bog is a, is a much more effective water store. Um, and a lot of the, the natural flood control methods in the UK have now based on restoring boglands as a key method of holding the water, excess rainfall up in the uplands. Biodiversity, just very quickly, uh, there's about, we have about 50% of the remaining uh, West, uh, raised bog in Western Europe. So we have a, a very important uh, amount of that. And I think it's about 20% of global blanket bogs. So we have a very significant complement of very rare and valuable habitats. Fens as well would be very rare and it would, would also be very uh, rarest type of peatland. And that's what we hope to be regenerating maybe as part of our work in the Midlands. And then we also have all of those rare species uh, that are associated with boglands, lap and wetlands, uh, corncrake, curlew, lapwing, marsh, fertility, which is in the back of my screensaver here, as you can see. Just a few possible solutions that we're going to be using to control uh, greenhouse gas emissions as part of the farm carbon project, uh, project in the Midlands. Um, if we were going to address the emissions, some kind of rehydration is going to be involved. So uh, we haven't done it yet, so I can't speak too much about it. Once we've done, hopefully we'll be able to come back and, and give you chapter and verse on it. But essentially the options, as, as far as we can see for the moment, is re-wet and let it rewild. Again, if it was kind of marginal lands, marginal grazing lands, that wouldn't be too much of an issue. If it's good grazing, maybe the partial re-wetting, as per the Dutch approach, would be a potential solution. Or alternatively, I think this is very interesting. We have our partners in Germany, um, who uh, Typha Technik, uh, and there are many other uh, types of polluted culture or wet agricultural crops uh, that would be available. So in this instance, you kind of have, have your cake and eat it. 
you can re-wet the field, lock in the CO2, and then grow a crop which will sequester the carbon from the atmosphere. And then in the case of cattails, it can be used as a sustainable building material. Uh, and according to the figures we're given, it's, it's very lucrative. Again, I, I believe things when I see them, but look, we have to try them and, and find alternatives here. Um, so that's that. Lastly, just to finish, um, uh, one of the questions I think a lot of farmers have is if a particular, if a field, a PT field is rewetted, what's going to happen to the field next to it? It might be PT. So um, from that perspective, we're also going to be looking at the adjacent lands from the point of view of, of regenerative agriculture. So a ryegrass monoculture has very poor water infiltration capacity. So there's the, the standard approaches, multi-species swords, mob grazing, and so on, which would increase the capacity of those lands to, to absorb additional water and maintain grazing uh, over a long period of the year. Okay, that was it. I don't know, no idea how I did on time in there, Pat. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Okay. Uh, uh, was I on? Was I on there uh, on song? You're fine. You're fine. We're, we're reasonably flexible anyway, so if we can move okay. on to, to Evan. Brilliant. Thank you. No problem. That was a fascinating insight. Evan, you'll need to unmute yourself there. Yeah, great. Okay. Um, so we have that now. We have that. Great. I'll get straight to it. Let's move this out of the way. Okay. So um, thanks very much, uh, Doug. That was a great presentation. Um, this will get uh, into the policy dimensions um, of the carbon farming initiative at European policy level. Um, so comparatively dry by, uh, by comparison, but uh, there you go. <clears throat> we'll move uh, straight into it. So you see here that the European Union are to launch their carbon farming framework uh, by the end of 2021. This publication is from AgFunder. It's a, a global blog for investors in the agricultural space. And um, you see that they've used uh, pictures there from Connemara um, uh, and have noted that um, the, the extraction from Europe's vast beet fields is a significant component of the European Carbon um, Farming Initiative. Uh, so my slides don't, oh yeah, okay, there we go. So why, uh, why carbon farming? So carbon farming and uh, regenerative agriculture can restore uh, functional ecosystems. They can uh, mitigate against climate change uh, effects. They can protect from drought, improve water quality, attenuate flooding and restore uh, biodiversity, can create healthy and sustainable, uh, sustainable communities in the, the process. So at national level, it's important to, to, to remember that while we're decarbonizing our energy and transport sectors, um, we should also be recarbonizing our landscapes um, and building healthy and resilient soil biology, uh, vegetation, woodland cover and biodiversity to return atmospheric carbon to its natural cycle in living terrestrial systems. So what is carbon farming? Well, carbon farming is an integrated green business model for agriculture um, that can create new income streams for rural communities while making landscapes and bioregions more resilient to uh, climate change. Um, so in terms of how it works, it's working as a conjunction between payment for results schemes on the one hand, and also in the context of the carbon markets. So as, uh, as Dr. McMillan has mentioned there earlier, um, you have two types of uh, carbon markets. You've got the ETS, which is mandatory, the European uh, trading scheme, and then the voluntary carbon markets, which are operated and managed by the UN at a global level, uh, which are voluntary and project led. Um, so uh, you can see here the an older framing uh, from the context of the carbon markets indicated by the blue arrow that says that a project that reduces greenhouse gas emissions can generate carbon credits that are certified under the Kyoto Pro Protocol or voluntary standards. Now, this is one way, um, and of course, peatland rewetting is reducing future emissions. Then the alternative, and especially important to the regenerative agricultural canon, is um, the sequestration of uh, carbon at a measurable rate uh, and the processing of this by methodology into a, uh, what is called a um, verified carbon unit. Um, so verified carbon units are created um, by the application of specific methodologies uh, to land practices. Um, and then the application of uh, what we've looked at earlier, the monitoring results and verification method. 
So um, what are the drivers then at a European policy level? Well, the main driver at European policy level is, of course, LULICEF, uh, the land use, land use Change and Forestry Regulation that came into effect in 2014. So the LULICEF regulation mandates that greenhouse gas emissions do not exceed removals uh, in the land use sector. So whatever in terms of nitrous oxide, methane, um, carbon emission is coming off of the land, the same, uh, that will be measured according to the LULICEF accountancy framework, and the same must be coming uh, back in by virtue of sequestration. So um, this, uh, this is happening within the land use sector, which means that um, the emissions from the land use sector have to be uh, brought back in through sequestration or removal in that same sector, known as the no debit rule. And it should be noted that the scope of uh, the LULICEF regulation is extended from forestry, where it was uh, created initially, to all land uses, including agriculture, and that by 2026, LULICEF will include accountancy for um, managed wetlands. So um, here's a quote from the uh, Vice President for the European Green Deal, Franz Timmermans, who says that our climate action must first and foremost produce human aid emissions, but we also need to restore and protect natural carbon sinks so that we can capture CO2 from the atmosphere and store it in our soils and forests. Carbon farming offers new income opportunities for farmers. It is an example of how the new common agricultural policies, eco schemes and private funding can reward agricultural practices that help us fight the climate and biodiversity crises. So it should be noted that uh, pilot projects are to be rolled out for carbon farming at national and partner member state levels across the European Union from 2023. Um, these uh, pilot projects will be co-funded through the European Life Programme and the European Agricultural and Regional Development Funds. Um, so uh, on that basis, I should note also that uh, there is a workshop hosted by the DECC uh, next Wednesday, a uh, bid proposal writing workshop with uh, Del Watt for the LIFE program specifically, if people are interested in pursuing that. Uh, um, so uh, recommendations from the Climate Change Advisory Council in their annual review in 2020 um, suggested specific policy innovation to encourage and enable higher rates of afforestation and improved management of high carbon soils. Um, this in, uh, includes peatlands, of course. The, the Council recommends that the role of farmers in the management of carbon stocks be acknowledged and that farmers should be incentivized to adopt measurable and verifiable practices that sequester carbon. The Council recommends positive, constructive engagement with the European Farm to Fork strategy um, and other uh, uh, to help achieve both uh, greenhouse gas emissions a reduction and other environmental benefits such as improved water quality um, and the government should introduce measures to significantly reduce nitrogen use by 2030. So of course carbon farming, regenerative agriculture, they have these attendant benefits of uh, increasing the soil organic carbon stock, this increases water infiltration and holding capacity on lands um, and then by application of multi-species swords, uh, Chagas have published research of course that show a 50% reduction in nitrogen application on those lands, all of which can be used in the context of this particular uh, program. So um, you can see here that uh, the Carbon Farming Initiative was set in place in April of this year, and it should we should note that uh, Farm Carbon was launched in March of this year, having been notified of the award in February. So we're slightly ahead of the curve here, which is uh, it's good for Ireland. Um, we've got the best foot forward and we have contributed uh, throughout the two year program of the European Roundtable on Carbon Farming. Um, and uh, and so we're, we're well placed to establish a national pilot here. So the first legal proposal on uh, the Carbon Farming Initiative will be launched by the end of 2021. And uh, a, an additional uh, an attendant carbon removal certification mechanism has been announced in the Circular Economy Action Plan due to be presented in 2023. Um, and so, uh, our program is two years. Um, the two-year baseline will assess conditions according to various practices uh, at baseline level. Um, and then through implement implementation, we will look at the results we, of course, for things like agroforestry, peatland rewetting, mineral soil regeneration, and livestock carbon auditing. Um, Long-term uh, changes have to be assessed. And that, of course, won't be possible within the two-year program. But um, as this uh, initiative shows, we will be extending our activities beyond the, the, the life Life cycle as the intention. So these are the four pillars of, uh, of carbon farming. Um, 
and uh, so the question then uh, is, what are we doing about it at uh, Green Restoration Ireland? Well, um, uh, as, uh, as uh, Dr. McMillan has mentioned, we are uh, a cooperative. Uh, we are looking at um, blending local approaches uh, to, um, uh, uh, to emissions reduction um, with the land use and land management sector, uh, with agriculture, by partnering community approaches with uh, business and um, and uh, schemes uh, of this nature to reduce carbon emissions um, in a verifiable uh, ways. So how are we going about doing that? Well, on the Farm Carbon Project, as, uh, um, as mentioned previously, we'll be assessing baselines, implementing uh, regenerative agricultural practices um, and restoration of peatlands, measuring the outcomes, developing payment for results schemes, uh, according to these and monitoring results and verification schemas. Um, additionally, we're also looking at uh, landscape scale sustainability planning frameworks. Uh, we're working together with Vera and their program Landscale, uh, which looks at all of the producers in a region, um, together with um, the forward planning of uh, these producers, such that you declimate risk production within the landscape and also that is used then according to um, economic, social and governance factors to de-risk uh, climate and uh, to de-risk investment within those uh, regions also. Um, uh, in addition, we're also uh, working to create uh, incentive structures for regenerative agricultural transition um, and the valuation and payment for the secondary production of ecosystem co-benefits. And so we're used to the phrase of primary production um, in agriculture, and it's quite interesting to see this um, concept of secondary production enter the field. So the valuation of ecosystem co-benefits, ecosystem services, the improvements to biodiversity, uh, air quality, um, water quality, um, soil organic carbon, and so on, and the valuation of these, uh, the me their measurement and the, um, uh, the making of payments based on these. And so that's uh, part of the, that's the core uh, focus of our work at uh, Green Restoration and uh, at Farm Carbon. Um, here you will see in blue from the technical document uh, published by the European Union on the Carbon Farming Initiative um, suggestions as to the nature of uh, the types of program that can be applied or the types of uh, measures that can be applied. And uh, below in black uh, in the next three slides, some of the things that we're doing at uh, Farm Carbon um, to illustrate how we're following this program. So in terms of de um, depleted arable land, uh, we are part partnering with uh, trees on the land uh, who have an EIP um, to investigate uh, silvo arable um, uh, methods. So the blending of uh, tree systems with, uh, with arable systems. Um, and we're going to be uh, coordinating in terms of baseline assessment um, and metric design for that system as part of our contribution to a national uh, carbon farming initiative uh, pilot. Uh, in terms of the planting of new forests and the restoration of degraded forests, the improvement of management of existing forests, we're um, but we have measures within our program that include riparian woodland buffers, native woodland development orchards and agroforestry. Um, and uh, speakers from uh, last week's webinar series, Eugene Curran and Ian Short, um, are members of our advisory committee there and we uh, look forward to developing that relationship with them. Um, in terms of supplying biomass for the production of long lasting bio-based products, as, uh, as Dr. McMillan mentioned earlier on, in partnership with the Fraunhofer Institute in Germany, we will be trialing um, polluted culture uh, or wet agriculture in preparation for the production of insulated panel boarding from reeds, rushes, wetland cropping systems, and so on. These same substrates uh, can be used in the development of alternatives to horticultural peat and alternatives to uh, peat-based animal beddings. Um, so then also in the protection of carbon-rich soils, such as grasslands and peatlands, um, of course, as mentioned previously, drained peat soils in Ireland are the single largest land use emission at an estimated eight megatons of carbon dioxide uh, per annum. So the primary focus of the Farm Carbon EIP is the delivery of a payment for results scheme to incentivize and accelerate peat soil rewetting in Ireland. 
Um, now, in terms of where people can find more information on this uh, uh, policy piece and uh, the directions as to how to go about building uh, pilots in this, you will find on the EU publications website the technical document on setting up and implementing results-based carbon farming mechanisms in the EU. So uh, with that, um, I'd like to say thank you very much uh, for having us along here. And for more information, you can contact us at eip at farmcarbon.ie. Thanks very much. stop sharing there okay that, that was a lot <laughs> in a very short space of time uh, uh, just remind people that we uh, that uh, if you post your questions uh, in relation or in relation to the talks on the question and answers and we'll we'll get to them i suppose one of the 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 questions i have is you're uh, in this project you're you're bringing farmers in who are uh, uh, operating on, on drain peas in, in particular. What's the project going to look like from, from their perspective? What are they going to be asked to do? Uh, and I suppose a follow-on question from, from that is, how does the economics of it look like to those farmers vis-a-vis -vis what they're doing at the moment is, is, is probably grazing animals in, in relatively difficult land to farm? You're on mute, Douglas. So uh, I'll, I'll feel this on you. Probably you'll get the next one, Evan. Um, just in terms of what we're asking them to do, we, we will be doing a whole farm survey and we will be essentially offering them a list of measures. Uh, we will be providing them with information about what that would entail. And then they'll be, they'll be selecting what they want to do. So in terms of the peat, peaty fields, if you like, as I, as I indicated, it'll be a re-wet and rewilding, partial rewetting, or alternative crops. As, as far as we see it. And then in terms of the economics, um, we, we have a, a farm accountant as part of the part of that, and we, we aim to look at that. But um, I think it hasn't been done before here, so we can't really elaborate. It's just kind yeah. of, we get stuck in, we're gonna do it, we're gonna monitor everything, record everything, and see what the results are. And, in, and the farmers will be compensated for being the, you know, the, the guinea pigs, if you like, in terms of doing this. So uh, I couldn't really elaborate uh, any further on that? If you had something to add, Evan, on that? Sorry, I've been looking at the questions in the Q and A. Uh, no, we're just just in terms of, I suppose, the the, the economics of of the uh, potential for, I suppose, earning income from the various components and the various outputs that you're talking about, vis-a-vis uh, -vis what's happening on the farms at the moment. Yes, so, um, you know, a drained peat field um, can emit anywhere between 8 and uh, 20 tonnes of carbon dioxide uh, per annum. So at the upper limit, that's about, you know, in the region of a thousand euro per hectare. Um, and so when you re-wet a field, you will have to change the, the grazing management practice on that field. There might be a reduction in the grazing. Um, and we have measures in the program to accommodate that and training programs in and around uh, changes in grazing. We're, um, so that aspect will be, will, will be looked at. We're also working with uh, uh, a farm accountant throughout the program will be working closely with the farmers. We do not intend, of course, to cost anybody anything. Uh, the intention is to benefit all farmers on the program um, economically while benefiting the, the biodiversity and, uh, and, and uh, ecological condition of the farms. Um, but uh, the, with what we've looked at so far, the indications are that this can be um, quite lucrative for farmers by contrast with uh, certain uses for their lands. Yeah. Okay. Porik, huge number of questions flying in. Yeah, and, and lots of uh, variety in them as well. Um, the first one I'm going to ask is, are you measuring methane production from re-wetted peatlands also? There was no mention of methane in, in the presentations. Um, so I think Evan had touched on that. Um, well, maybe if you, because so we have the, the, perhaps you can elaborate on that, Evan. Well, he mentioned that we'll have three eddy covariance towers. So perhaps I'll let you elaborate on there, Evan. Sure, yeah. So um, in the Farm Carbon Programme, we're working with uh, 
Gary Lanigan from the Soil Carbon Observatory. And so three of the signpost farms um, will be based within our program. And uh, the control, I believe, will be at Gertine, um, whereby the gaseous emissions from the lands will be measured um, over the life cycle of the program with a view to building out um, you know, appropriate MRV um, for, for that aspect. Now, the, the current research is that the long-term gain in terms of carbon emission uh, or avoided carbon emission is far outweighed by the methane production um, in uh, the rewetting process. Um, also, methane is on the short cycle, while carbon is a long cycle um, in terms of the um, the emission of uh, carbon dioxide enters the upper atmosphere, and it takes uh, quite some time. Methane is um, is is quite a shorter cycle and has more potential um, to be uh, reabsorbed into uh, the, the the system at the at the at the ground level. So um, I can't say too much more on it than that. Yeah. So the, the towers will measure all of that gas flux, uh, just to answer the question, Porig. So that will be monitoring both the CO2 and the methane emissions, and will give us an overall picture uh, from the sites that they'll be installed upon. A work in progress. Watch mm -hmm. this space. Okay, so currently farmers are receiving a one-off payment of €1,000 for every hectare of woodland from private corporations, and a company can reap the benefits. So this is kind of a common theme that's coming through, is once the credits are sold, um, can they be sold again, or is there... Actually, another question that kind of ties in with that is if agriculture sells those emissions, can agriculture still reap the reward and the reduction that's coming from those emissions? Um, I think the, well, I suppose one of the key things is that you can't sell the same offset twice. That's uh, double counting. So that's kind of into scam territory. Um, so that you, if you were selling a, like a plot of uh, an, an avoided emissions, but then also the, I think the farm carbon, oh, sorry, the carbon farming uh, uh, document talks about a combination of public and private sector. So it is actually proposing that combination of maybe the payments and or now what that will look like, uh, as you said, as you said, just a second ago, probably is watch this space. Uh, but uh, that's, that's what we're envisaging and hoping will be, will be the case. And do you see it something that might continue that big business will offset carbon credits or offset their, their carbon emissions via agriculture by paying farmers to do so? Yeah, well, we have a we have a just such company for our projects in Mayo. So we have an interest. And the key thing uh, is to do something. We want to have a case study and see how it works out. Um, so if that goes well, then we hope that will be the first of many. Uh, but there's a lot of interest. Um, and in particular, I think what we've seen with all of the forest fires is you know, planting a woodland isn't necessarily a good bet, you know. Uh, I'd say there's quite a few carbon offsets that have gone up in smoke over the last few months in various countries. So uh, bogland rewetted is much more resilient. Uh, and as I said, the carbon is already there. You're just locking it in. Okay. Um, again, kind of on the same theme from a tillage perspective, there's a lot of carbon capture actions taking place on farms of straw incorporation and cover crops and so on. When do you guys think that farmers will get the monetary benefit of that carbon capture? Well, you know, first of all, um, baselines have to be assessed for um, any future um, carbon units to be generated. Um, they can only be generated against measured baselines. And so, um, so far at Irish, uh, like in Ireland, there's no um, nationally led program to develop this. There are the beginnings of it, of course, in the, in the Soil Carbon Observatory. And then um, as launched last week, the National um, Soil Sampling Pilot, uh, which we would encourage farmers to engage in. This is also uh, the beginnings of developing a set of baseline scenarios such that um, projects of the nature that we're looking at are uh, can be developed but until those baselines are assessed it's very difficult for farmers to turn gains into uh, into carbon units and therefore economic benefit to themselves just just to add to that as part of the project we are actually trying to develop a uh, a, a rapid device for measuring soil organic carbon, what we call a soil organic carbon infrared um, transition tool. Um, so we're hoping that will be one of the outputs, as I mentioned, we were developing technologies um, in this area. So again, that would really facilitate that. As Evan was saying, we need the baselines, but that can be expensive and so on. So the, the idea here with this uh, instrument, if it should work, uh, 
uh, you'll be able to rapidly measure that. Then subsequent to doing whatever the improvement measures are, you will be able to measure uh, what the additional carbon sequestration is that has occurred. And then of course you can get that money because at the moment, because it's tricky to do, that's kind of the side of the carbon offset in business that isn't touched. It's all above ground. The below ground stuff, they don't go near it because it's too much hassle. Okay, a lot of questions here on the common agricultural policy and the incorporation of um, what you guys have discussed and presented being part of the next cap. Um, has there been any consultation or are there any plans in that space? In, in terms of in Ireland? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I think there were multiple comments made by um, the department and ministers uh, last over the course of the last two weeks. So, um, I think the minister's position is that there's no national um, program to be developed. Now, that that's that statement is quite interesting because, on the one hand, if you don't regulate it, um, then it's open for voluntary carbon market participation. That's the that's one thing. Then, on the second hand, the European Union are developing a carbon farming initiative, so technically the Irish government can take part in that. Why would it develop its own? Um, yet at the same time, um, the Irish government could very well uh, lend its energies to developing um, with the National Standards Association Ireland um, ISO standard methodologies for um, the various uh, practices involved in uh, the carbon farming initiative such that uh, the sector can, can move ahead. Um, we're one project and we're doing our, our bit with uh, peatland rewetting uh, in the first instance, but there's, uh, there, there's plenty of work to be done in this space. Um, it would be interesting uh, to see more um, energy coming into it from, from policy and department levels. Mm. Okay. Yeah, I think it's fair to say that's a, a very complex subject at the moment and with probably not a huge pile of, of, of clarity as to exactly where it's, where it's going. There's a few questions there in relation to uh, forestry. You mentioned agroforestry and, and potential for, for forestry in, in, in these areas. Could you maybe elaborate on what your thinking is in relation to the role of forestry, uh, which is there's, there's sometimes controversy in relation to forestry and, and, and peatland. So what do you see as the potential role in terms of, of the, the, uh, may, or the, the, the um, uh, protecting of carbon within the, our uh, and the mitigating of, of losses? Um, Doug, do you want to take that one for, I, 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 I can come in after you, Doug, if you want to go ahead. I'm, I'm very sorry, uh, Pat, I was actually busy, I, I thought that uh, sounded more like Evan's question, so I was reading a very interesting queries on that, and I wanted to come to them if that was possible, so I'm very sorry. <laughs> I wasn't. <laughs> you are in the, no, just in terms of you, you mentioned the potential role of forestry uh, um, in in this whole project, uh, and I suppose it can be controversial the the uh, planting of forests on uh, peatland. And I'm just wondering where you see that potentially going. Is it a particular type of forestry? Is it agroforestry, or is there much of a role there? Um, I think it's definitely a big issue, um, and it's a big. Um, with the current planting on peatlands is, yeah, it, it, it's kind of counterproductive in a lot of ways. So it's definitely something that needs to be reviewed. Uh, we are hoping to look at it, but I haven't really had much time to delve into it yet. But yeah, definitely that is that is an issue. And for example, one of the farms we're looking at, they're actually planted forestry and we ran out, we were depthing the field, the, the peat, and we ran out of probes. So it was over eight meters deep of peat with forestry, which is ridiculous. You know, that is not the what we should be doing um so uh, but then i suppose in the other ones where maybe it's, a, it's some kind of re-wetting and as you were suggesting then pat maybe uh trees alder and willow again we have to research this area um so we haven't covered that yet okay just when you mentioned maybe... re-wetting douglas sorry go ahead evan oh um yeah just in terms of um uh okay planted deep peat is a <clears throat> is a major question. You know, you'll be aware it's August that there was research published in the last three months that has uh, re-estimated the emissions factor from planted peat. It's three times higher than formally um, assessed. And this places uh, planted peat, planted deep peat as a net emitter. 
um, and therefore close attention should be paid because managed wetland when it comes in in 2026 to the LULICEF accountancy framework, um, you know, th there will be close attention paid and there will be a significant cost to the state um, for uh, the emissions from the sector. You know, we did mention 8 million tonnes from the transition grasslands earlier. That's working out at, uh, in the region of uh, over half a billion euro per annum um, at current prices. And those prices are, are, are not going down. Um, so uh, that's that, that's very important to look at. Planted deep peat is also very important to look at, especially with regard to um, the mandate to replant. So where you have a non-performing um, as forestry uh, plantation on deep peat, there is a logic uh, to looking at the um, felling of it and then the rewetting as opposed. We'll know that these things tend to take significant time but we there's not a lot of time to get to turn this around and uh, so it doesn't need to be looked at quite quickly then in the wider dimension of the carbon farming um, initiative what are the functions of forestry well it's been found that a 15 to 20 meter buffer of uh, riparian woodland planted along the bank side will catch 95 percent of agricultural runoff before it hits the water course so you get the carbon from the trees, you get the increased soil carbon build up as a result of the root system of those trees also, <clears throat> and the attendant microbiology, excuse me. And, um, and also you get the improvement, the co-benefit of uh, uh, the improvement to the water course. So we'll be working with the agricultural catchment program to assess measures such as these in, in, in our own program. Um, then of course, there's the silver pasture and silver arable as were mentioned by uh, Eugene and Ian um, last week that will be looked at over the course of our program. So there's a there's a variety of dimensions to that question there with regard to uh, on-farm trees. Mm. So both of you actually mentioned re-wetting um, in, in both of your answers. And just one comment here in relation to drain blocking may actually sometimes cause drying of adjacent land. And is that going to be measured or accounted? And I'll just combine with that, uh, there's another comment or stats question around this a similar topic that farmers would expect the land that they already have and the hedgerows that they already have and the, the, the carbon that's already a part of their farm to be accounted for with carbon credits. Uh, just make a comment on both of those, please. Absolutely. Um, that, that, that would be our, our view on those things. Um, just could I, um, yeah, no, that, that I, I would absolutely, that's what we're in favor of. Um, I don't know. Sorry, I don't know if I... What was yeah, that? no, you're, you're hitting the nail on the head, yeah. Is that it? I mean, what's the... The, the re-wetting then is another one as regards if you're re-wetting one, is it going to drain land beside it? The water is coming from somewhere. Um, well, again, I said I like a, a healthy boat will actually hold and release water steadily. As I said, where it's cut, it's bleeding. You know, when you get excess rain, it will just, you get flood, peak flood events, whereas actually it's a big sponge. And like a woodland, similarly, it will actually release it over a period of time. So that shouldn't be happening. Again, obviously I'm sure there may be circumstances in which it does happen and we'll have to look at those individually, but generally that's that's not how it would react. I, I just, could I just make a comment there, Porig, on Porig. one of the things, just what somebody was saying about the comment on the negative words, degraded, moderately degraded, that wasn't my terminology. So as I said, we are aiming to do like an, an Irish version and it was saying, you suggested more positive terms, which I think is a great idea. Uh, but also it isn't, and it's saying it's, it, it promotes helplessness. It is actually easy. And that's the point. We want to have examples where it's done and then you can come and see. And it isn't that complex. It's kind of reversing the process of what was done previously. Um, but I think that's a great idea. Um, and can I, can I continue? Or? You can, of course. Yeah, 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 yeah it might be quicker because there's, there's lots of questions there. So, sure, sure. so just on, the, on the additionality, uh, there was the question there. So, uh, the key thing is that you know if you're getting the money for the offset and you can't have you can't have done it yourself already. So if you put a wind farm anyway and you're getting the money, you can't then go and look for credits for the wind farm. It's the same thing with the rewettings. So the point is that you wouldn't be doing it, and that's obviously the case with a lot of bogans. No one's going to go back and block the drains up unless they get some kind of funding to do that. So that's the additionality. And uh, that's one of the key thing, the key issues of the carbon credit industry. And one of the other questions was, yeah, will this be for carbon credits? Absolutely. That's what we're, we're trying to start a process whereby we um, have baseline projects and with a view to having verified carbon credits in the future for sale. And of course, that increases the value. You know, once they're verified by the third party, 
now that adds value to them and you can get a better price. Um, so that would be an important way of reaping more benefit from, from carrying out those, those actions. Do you want to comment on the biochar while you're in that section? Biochar, we have a lot going on, a lot of moving parts in the project. But yeah, we'd love to do that. Um, Evan's done quite a bit of research into that area. But I think what we have to do is be reasonable. We have so many resources, but what we'd be looking to do is to pull in uh, other projects with other partners. Um, as we're looking also, we, we, we'll be looking at micro and fungi uh, degradation of peat soils. We'll be looking to pull in other research work around that. So that's absolutely the, the objective to investigate all of those different opportunities. Uh, but we'll have to get more resources for that. So the question yeah, where I mentioned Apori, Doug. Um, Apori is, uh, yeah, go ahead. No, 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 you, no, that's it. I'm, I'm doing all the talking. Far ahead, man. Oh, no, no. Well, Lopori is one of, uh, one of our a doctoral students who will be working with us uh, throughout the course of the program. Um, and he's worked as extensively with biochar in agroecological production systems. Uh, he's done a very wide range of research. And uh, so there's a lot of um, interest in the use of uh, biochar, say, because biochar would stop butyric acid formation. You, it reduces ammonia emission and so on um, from uh, slurry tanks and uh, and the like and so there's a as part of our whole farm planning we will be looking at um, site specific uh, measures and implementation dependent upon the particular conditions of those farms so a certain farm might have reduced slurry storage or might need um, to, to to deal with uh, with these kinds of issues and in that case we would bring in partners or work specifically on that particular program yeah I think the question is coming in again. I have two of them here again. Um, even though I kind of think you've answered it all, you have answered it, but just to be very, very clear for people, um, you're saying that if something is grant aided as regards rewetting a bog or planting forestry, something that captures carbon, that they cannot sell those credits. No, 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 no. Uh, did we say that? Not get paid for those credits again. Um, I think I was saying in relation to the forestry, I think that's the policy. Again, we don't, this isn't, this is a new space, so it's not determined. Um, but I think, as I said, the, the, the carbon, the farming, uh, the, the policy indicates a PPP, you know, a public pub, uh, private partnership approach. And as I said, we would envisage, because, you know, the, the credits actually wouldn't be huge, you know, so I think to make it worthwhile, it should be a combination of private and or improved land use options from a from an environmental perspective but again I, i'm not writing the policy we just we're just here to try things out get the information and then feed into that uh, what we dis, what we what we what we learn um so i i wouldn't uh, I, I don't have my tea leaves here so but uh, i think it sh we'll, we'll see how it goes <laughs> evan, evan might have his crystal ball or maybe he doesn't need it evan have you um uh no sorry Porik, I just, um, if it's okay, I accidentally clicked the button in the quick question and answers, and I don't want to offend anybody. There was a woman who had asked a question on what are the four pillars of carbon farming. And um, in my effort to answer, I um, yeah, made a mistake there. So just to let whoever that person was know that they're agroforestry, peatland restoration, mineral soil regeneration, and livestock carbon auditing. And there's also the question of whether energy on farm will be included in the audit. And uh, I would just want to make the point that that would be very interesting and that an Irish approach might look at that um, specifically because SECs, um, uh, rurally led SECs would be viable for the RECC, the Renewable Energy, sorry, the RESS, the Renewable Energy Supply Schemes, um, uh, Section 8 Community Tranche Disbursement. And uh, that could be a, quite a significant strategic development for uh, rural renewable energy in Ireland. Also, you're on a roll, Evan. So you were also asked for the EU publication link for setting up and implementing um, that you mentioned in there. So if you could make that available to us, we'd we'd um, share it with the listeners as well. Would they be able to get all of these questions and and answer them via some other? We'll we'll make them available to you. Yeah, that'd be super. That'd be brilliant. Just to get them all answered. Or, the after, after the... And that's we'd be very happy to have them. Okay, listen, I think we're going to have to, we're, we're, we've hit our, our, our timeline, uh, so we're going to have to call a halt there. I think the one conclusion you would have to draw is there's a huge amount of questions to be answered that we don't yet have, have, have the answers to. Uh, and it's, it's going to be a process of learning. And I, I think that's what the, the projects that you're, you're undertaking are all about. It's about learning about the, 
the practical elements and the economics uh, and the, the verification. So a huge amount of learning, but I don't think you could underestimate the importance of, of the, the work you're doing. Uh, and you talked about uh, 10 million tons, just to put that in context, like that's half the agricultural emissions of, of approximately 20 million tonnes. So that's the amount that's on, at stake in, in, in this space. So it is huge. And you also mentioned that this comes into the reckoning. It's not really being counted at the moment, but it comes into the reckoning later in this decade. And then that's when it will really, really become important. Am I, is that a fair uh, uh, conclusion? Yeah, four uh, years. I think we will need you back again. Uh, to deal with maybe specific topics. And in particular, I think maybe the, the notion of what the implementation at farm level might look like. Uh, and that's something I think maybe we will have you back uh, sooner rather than later to, to start looking at as you get your project up, up and running. So thank you again, Douglas and, and, and Evan, really appreciated it. As I say, it's going to be an area of huge importance uh, going forward. At this point, I'd like to thank our production team of Andy Boland and, and Yvonne Marr. Uh, next week, we have uh, Dr. David Stiles of UL looking at the implications of climate neutrality for agriculture, land use, and, and, and forestry in, in Ireland. So it's a, a, a follow on uh, uh, topic, and uh, we look forward to seeing you again next week. So thank you very much for joining us and enjoy your weekend. Goodbye. <laughs>